everyone doing? I'm Sam Jones. I'm on Twitter at Sam Jonester, so give me a follow, shoot me a DM. Um, I'd love to hear from you. So I'm a developer here in Philadelphia, and I sling code in a lot of different languages, from Node to Rails to React, and maybe do a little hassle in my spare time. But when, when I'm using all of those different tools, I'm sure to always have a standard way to interact with my applications. A standard way to test them, a standard way to deploy them, and this is always constant. This is what interests me the most about DevOps. When I'm not coding, I like to cycle and I cook. I'm also a husband and a father. I have a 17-month-old daughter who's just starting to put words together, and it's really cool to watch. And I have a two-month-old son who just learned to smile. It's pretty cute. Um, you'll be able to tell when I get into this talk. But two things that are the most important to me as a technologist are honesty and empathy. I work for Test Double. Test Double is a group of awesome people who like to write nice code. And uh, if you'd like our help writing nice code, or if you'd like to write nice code with us, or just learn what nice code means, then uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Test Double, or you can email us below at testdouble.com. And I also uh, organize with Sarah, who's uh, at the front booth, Sarah, this morning. Uh, it's Software is Craft. It's a meetup here in Philadelphia. Uh, it's a great community focused on, in my opinion, uh, topics that are more worthwhile than just the latest JavaScript uh, micro templating framework. So if you're free the last Tuesday of the month, stop by, say hi, or pitch us a talk. We'd love to have you. Today, I'm going to talk about interviews. So I did my best to capture the essence of a whiteboard interview in a snarky piece of code here, right? There are some super grumpy Twitter threads that denounce this type of interview, and I think they're right. Like, I generally agree with them. I think that whiteboard interviews like this are terrible, terrible for the industry. Currently, I'm on the interviewing team at Task Double, and I'm happy to say that since we're 100% remote, <coughs> we don't even have whiteboards. So, that's a plus. So, a little bit of a backstory before I dig too deep into this. Has anyone here been on the receiving end of a bad technical interview? Yeah, I see lots of hands. All right, how about this one? Has anyone here given a terrible technical interview? Still lots of hands. Mine's up with you. I, uh, I've given some really terrible technical interviews. My first job out of college, I was uh, on the interviewing team, and I'll be the first to tell you that I was absolutely not qualified. I had this check checklist of like Java terms, and I had a couple terrible behavioral questions, and I administ administered them on any poor, unsuspecting intern that walked in the room. I might not have been the most qualified, but I definitely wasn't the least qualified either. There were people that were hiring based on whether they thought somebody would be uh, a valuable addition to the volleyball game in inter-office game week. So obviously, I'm not going to show you that checklist today. It's, you can guess what's on it, just words like uh, private static and abstract class anyways. Because since then, I've been able to join a company that uh, cares and is constantly trying to improve their interview process. So thanks to my experiences at Test Double, I'll be able to show you some of the better practices, uh, things that have helped us along the way, and things that we're constantly trying to improve ourselves. And this is a better technical interview. Let's make a valuable interview. Uh, we want to truly understand a candidate's skills, and we want the candidate to get the best feel for what it's like to work for us as a company. We also want the candidate to feel that the interview was valuable to them as well. Let's make an honest interview. We're going to say what we're thinking throughout the, throughout the process instead of just hiding our agenda. We're going to actually encourage the candidate just like they would if they were on our team already. And we'll ask candidates their viewpoints instead of just assuming. Let's make a collective interview. We don't work behind glass. We don't work in isolation. So we're not going to interview that way either. Instead, we'll encourage dialogue and conversation because that's how you truly get to know somebody. It's an important chance to see how we're going to work with the candidate uh, how they're going to learn from the team, and how they'll teach everyone around them. Most importantly, though, let's try to make a nice interview. And to do that, let's first reflect on some interviews that make us cringe, some of those whiteboard-type interviews uh, that I was describing in the beginning. We're going to take specific steps to improve those interviews. So to create a nice interview, first we're going to look at, uh, we're going to set goals for our entire interview process. And like I said, we're going to look at some bad experiences and. Uh, intimidating practices, talk about them, analyze them, and use them to set goals for our process. So we're going to look at three types of bad experiences. In the first bad experience, uh, maybe I'm interviewing for a job that deploys Azure, but I've only ever used AWS, <coughs> or maybe all of my deployments already are automated and they use containers, but I've just never heard the word uh, immutable infrastructure before. 
Or maybe I'm being asked to count the number of divots in a golf ball, or how to count the number of streetlights in Salt Lake City. And these questions, they feel like tricks, like I'm being judged based solely on my ability to pull a number out of thin air. These types of questions, they don't give us a good sense of what a candidate is actually capable of. We want to bring out a candidate's best qualities to get a more clear assessment of what they will do on the job. So therefore, therefore our first goal will be to highlight the candidate's abilities. And the second type of bad experience, maybe I'm worried that I'll be asked to compare the big O notation of bubble sort versus nerve sort, and why does this matter if I'm just writing chef scripts anyways? So there's a rare chance I might need to know some of this stuff, but I can always just research it later, or better yet, ask somebody for help on the job. Maybe I'm being asked to code a trivial algorithm like one that determines whether the parentheses and the string are matched. And the worst part is that when I'm doing this, I'm doing it in an online editor that doesn't encourage good coding practices like uh, code design, or even allow for testing, and it neglects the things that I care about the most in my day-to-day -day development job. These types of interviews, they're intimidating because that's not how a candidate is actually going to work in real life. They've got good tools, they've got Google, and most importantly, the rest of the team to talk to and ask for help from once they've been hired. So therefore, our second goal will be to reflect the job a candidate is actually going to be performing. And the third type of bad experience, I might hear words like, okay, moving on. And in my opinion, that is the opposite of, trans of a transparent process. When somebody says that, I have no idea whether I'm just being judged because I haven't configured Reddit before. And I'll definitely be wondering how I'm being graded. And unfortunately, those little algorithms and uh, check, checklists filled with like uh, popular buzzwords, they don't really show what a, what a company values in a developer. Is it better to make cleaner, smaller units or to rush a solution? Should I research before I start or am I expected to just have memorized the syntax for left out or joined within an anonymous table. Can I ask for help, or am I expected to go it alone? Situations like this in unrealistic environments, they make, they, with, when they're paired with an unclear rubric, it creates a uh, pressure that's at odds with how people actually work day to day, -to -day and the things that you really value in your code base. These types of exercises, they don't make the candidate feel like they're going to be supported, and they give the impression that heroic knowledge, much more important, and thoughtful actions and collaboration. So to make the interview process more valuable for everyone, our third goal will be to give feedback, yes, actually give feedback and talk to the person during the actual interview. So those were the goals we outlined for an interview process. As we talk about how to implement them uh, in our interviews, we need to be conscious of the fact that this is going to be a continuous process of improvement. No one is ever going to give the perfect technical interview. Instead, it's much more valuable to be constantly cautious of the areas that you would like to improve, have check-ins, make sure you're moving in the right direction, and uh, still improving, and um, yeah, so just make sure that you're um, making things better. So we can begin by clearly setting expectations. We want to know what's being asked of the candidate before they arrive. We want to know what they're going to be graded on, and we need to tell them. We can tell them you know, when we set up the initial meeting bite, for example. So I'm a consultant, and the key to a successful meeting or a successful engagement is to set the expectations properly. And it's the same for an interview as well. Our expectations should focus on the specific things that we want to learn about the candidate when they spend time with us. The candidate should be able to break down work and decide which direction to approach the problem. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they approach the problem in the same way that I do just that they are able to uh, break things down and drive development forward. This also shows a candidate's ability to uh, break code in maintainable pieces and how they design a system, how they can uh, think about different components within a system and how they interact. We need to be clear that when we're asking a candidate uh, to communicate, we need to be clear that we are asking a candidate to communicate their strategy as well. Don't just assume that they understand that communication is a metric that they're being graded on unless it's been made explicitly clear. So explicitly define communication as, as that metric, and uh, you'll make it clear that your company does value good communication in their employees. Developers learn every single day, and if you can build a learning culture at your place of work, it's a powerful way to make sure that 
everybody on your team is constantly leveling up. And when a new team member starts, they're going to be doing a lot of learning. They need to learn the tool set, they need to learn the culture at the company, and they also need to learn the design patterns that are already in place in the code base, who to go to to ask questions. So basically learning is going to be their job when they first start. And we want to be clear that we're gauging a candidate's ability to learn during the interview process. Next, let's try to be humble. Uh, we don't need to be the smartest person in the interview. I found that it's much more effective to be humble and try to make a point to, to uh, learn something from the candidate as well. Because when a, new when a new team member isn't learning, what they're doing is teaching what they've just learned to somebody else on the team. So let's ask questions and be humble and try to test the candidate's ability to contribute to the team in a larger way than just by pushing code. So we've clearly defined the expectations for a successful interview. So there are some, some things that we can do now uh, throughout the interview process to encourage dialogue and to show empathy and make it a nicer process for everybody involved. We do this because dialogue is very important. Uh, it's, it's a way to get a better understanding of a candidate and it allows us to represent our company in a better way as well. We can take actions to make, to make it safe for dialogue to occur. We can take actions to eliminate biases that could uh, cause us to hire the wrong person. And we can use an advocate to represent the candidate throughout the process. So I'm sure you already tried to make it safe for your team to share ideas, to uh, share problems, ask for help, uh, to encourage each other. You probably do all of those things already. And if you do, then your interview should represent that idea as well. So try to make a candidate feel safe. And when you do this, it allows them to open up, and it shows that when they're on your team, you will actually care for them. Here's some techniques that I've found uh, help, that help make it safe and create a, a nice environment for dialogue to occur. As a company, it's important to know what you value. And until you have a clear, unified vision of what your values are, all of your interviews are going to be subjective, and they're going to be interpreted loosely by everybody that does an interview. And the candidates that you hire are also going to re uh, reflect the values that you, that you portray. And if your values are honest, and if they're truly expressed by everybody that's involved, then you're going to hire people that share and also want to help you, uh, help you spread those values as well. A warning, though, the opposite is true as well. If your values, if they seem canned, if they seem like they're just marketing, then you're going to hire people that are okay with that surface level of sincerity on your team. Next, try to humanize yourself. So be human and show that you can be vulnerable with your team. Share a story. Uh, get to know the person that you're interviewing before you dig into the hard stuff. Set the mood to make it safe for dialogue to occur. We do this because I'm sure your team is not just a bunch of stiffs who always like to be correct and powerful. I'm guessing they're more like me. They're just squishy humans with real human problems. And that's OK. We should embrace that. And hopefully, everybody on your team is encouraged to embrace and discuss the human aspects of working together. And if that's the case, the interview should reflect that as well. Also, don't be afraid to compliment the person that you're interviewing. People I've seen have often like to play poker with a candidate during an interview. They kind of treat the encounter like it's a standoff, like anything they say could affect negotiations or some BS like that later on in the process. But in my opinion, that neglects, neglects the fact that you're interviewing somebody that you're going to spend about a quarter of your week, every single week, talking to. And not only does this elicit defensiveness in a candidate, it completely disregards the fact that your company is being interviewed as well. Because after all, nobody wants to work with somebody that gives them stone cold judgment over somebody who gives them compliments, positive criticisms, and helps them improve. I'd also like to talk about internal stories. So an internal story is something that we tell ourselves when we don't have all of the facts about a situation or a person. An example might be, the candidate was five minutes late. That means they obviously <coughs> don't value my time as the fancy pants interviewer. That was a silly example, but I'm sure you can think of uh, more real life examples in the, way that, uh, in, the way, in the interviews that you've given in the past. But the truth is, nobody knows why that person was late, and if it's important, for the success of the interview, then ask, don't assume. When you show tolerance and you ask and you try to understand a candidate, it builds trust and it enables real conversations to happen. The next thing is a simple reframing exercise. This helps a candidate feel welcomed regardless of their experience, their background, 
or their career goals, even if those don't align properly with the team that they're interviewing for, or even your company. Instead of saying no to a candidate that doesn't have the necessary experience, try to have the attitude that you're saying not yet instead. This tiny little attitude adjustment, it can be very powerful in creating a valuable experience for every candidate that comes through your interview process. It fosters a lasting impression and it shows goodwill towards, uh, towards the well-connected technical community. So try to use this as a way to frame the conversations and make them more valuable, even if you decide to say not yet to that person. And the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, unintentional discrimination, because it's a lot easier than you think to uh, use stereotypical terms that can alienate a candidate or those that, an alien, that a candidate cares about. And when you use terms like salesmen or guys, even just offhand, it's a quick way to shut down dialogue, and instead we want to make it safe. So we need to try to eliminate any, any discrimination. There's a lot more examples that could go on this list. So I'm sure you can think of a ton. So be conscious of them in your day-to-day -day communications. And just like your values, this one isn't just an interview topic. This one should run deep on your team. Fairness in the interview process is probably already a goal as well, right? Um, I'm sure you want every interview to feel like it was fair and successful. Here are some techniques that I found that help us make Eliminate bias and mission, truly make the interview more fair. So the first one is another little reframing exercise. We challenge ourselves to think about the idea of a cultural fit. When you think about a cultural fit, you can unintentionally bias yourself to hire those that are already like you. A simple solution is to reframe this into thinking about somebody as a cultural addition. Is this person going to add value to the current culture? Or are they going to bring uh, new experiences, new value to the team that you don't already have, or are they just going to bring more of the same? This little reframing can help overcome some of the biases that you may have that are preventing you from, uh, from improving the, the diversity of your company or your team. When we're interviewing, we need to objectively gauge a candidate. And a good way to do this is to have a structured rubric. The rubric should be viewed as a guide for structuring interactions and increasing fairness. It shouldn't be a gatekeeper, it shouldn't be a checklist, anything like that. The rubric should prompt real discussion rather than elicit a canned response. So as an example, a terrible rubric point would be, does the candidate have 10 years experience with X technology? On the other hand, a fantastic example is, do they seek to establish understanding or are they only interested in their own ideas? Very different question. It's not a canned question, and it doesn't elicit a canned response. It helps guide discussion instead. When you're thinking about your rubric, it's also important to uh, treat it like the code that the candidate's eventually going to be writing. It should be malleable, and it should be refactored off and make sure that it's not just another checklist in the process. Candidates should also feel confident that after they've gone through the interview process and that rubric's been filled out, that the decision was made based solely on abilities, that it was objective. And a good way to ensure this is to hold all of the interviewers accountable for, the, for documenting their decisions throughout the process. And the structured rubric questions that I was talking about, they need more than just a numerical score. So one thing that's helped us a lot is to use real words to describe each response. And also to give long-form text boxes that ensure that an interviewer is being objective and is being thoughtful when they're making decisions. And when they're making those decisions, interviewers need to be given the appropriate time to fill in their responses. If the interviewer feels rushed to get back to real work, then they're not taking time to properly consider and evaluate a, evaluate a candidate. And if a decision is made hastily, you could be hiring a cultural negation instead of a cultural addition. So be clear that evaluation time is real work, that it's important, and you'll get more objective feedback. The last thing I'd like to talk about is anchoring. So anchoring is a trick that our monkey brains like to play on us. Once the anchor point is set, then all of our thinking about the candidate is going to be biased, <coughs> biologically compromised. So be cautious about providing anchoring information to interviewers before they've interviewed a candidate or before they've filled out their rubric. Trust an interviewer to perform an objective evaluation by themselves instead. Some examples of uh, anchoring could be broadcasting that this person's a rock star or this person is definitely not going to work out before somebody else has had a chance to interview a person. Even just talking about how did the interview go is a way to set an anchoring point. 
and a surefire way of setting anchoring point is telling it's important that I have a great candidate for you. So in addition to making it safe and eliminating biases, it also helps to create an advocate for the candidate. And this person is not an interviewer. Since this person is first considered an advocate, their focus shouldn't be to find a candidate's flaws and leave them out. They need to make sure that a candidate's first experience during the interview is positive. They'll also be a candidate's main point of contact throughout the interview. They need to clarify what's being asked of the candidate throughout the rest of the process. In addition to clarifying the values of your culture, of your team, of your company. Make sure that they understand the type of work they're going to be doing once they start with you. Because it's often really hard to understand what an employee at a company does just based on online marketing and a single job post. They also will coordinate interviews because, like I mentioned in the last time, an easy way to uh, create an anchoring point is to talk about the interview between interviews. So they can coordinate the transition between interviewers. interviewers. Um, and this is going to help prevent one interviewer, um, one interview from biasing the next, even in unintentional, nonverbal ways. So it's nice to read about your company's values in a blog post, but it's much more powerful if you have a discussion around them and show that they're truly felt by people involved. Uh, so an advocate is here to make a connection with the person. So it, because it's important for a candidate to understand the expectations of an employee regarding cultural values once, they, once they've joined the team. All right, so that was uh, the hard work, not for the fun stuff, the actual interview. So at Test Double, we do two types of technical interviews. We do a take home and we do a pair. We do this because uh, it reflects the way that we work as consultants. But they might not reflect the way that you work. So we'll examine the benefits of each and help you decide what's right for you. A take-home exercise is used to show how a candidate delivers quality code, and then how they collaborate to review and refactor it later. So let's encourage a candidate to use the tools that they're most comfortable with, whether that's Atom, Vim, RubyMine, who cares what it is. But we want them to use the tools that's, most, that's going to make them most successful. We're also going to limit the time that a candidate uh, has to spend on this, uh, this take-home exercise. We want the focus to be on workflow and process and not rushing to completion. So let's be clear that it's basically impossible to finish this exercise in, in the amount of time that we're giving them and encourage the candidates to take notes on areas that they would like to refactor and talk about during the review, during the discussion. This time limit is also going to hopefully combat some of the selection bias towards candidates with more free time, but most important to me, it's going to shift the focus from rushing a, a sh uh, from sh shipping a rush solution to creating a well-factored partial solution. It's going to let us focus on how a candidate designs code in a production quality way. And this is more important than seeing whether they know some trivial algorithm that they can just research later. Some important things to focus on are a candidate's ability to test, write understandable code, and break work with small manageable units. During this review, uh, we're also going to have a dialogue. We're going to use the code that they wrote as a starting place for the real interview, for the, for the discussion, for the dialogue. Everyone discusses code and does peer reviews, and this interview captures that. We're also going to refactor some things with the candidate, because we want to see how they rename things, how they allow code to change shape, and whether their tests make that change safe. So that was a take home. The last one we want to talk about is a pair. Let's look at the benefits of, of a pair session in contrast with take home. So a pair session is a chance to learn about how a candidate works directly with a peer and how they break down a problem. Again, we're going to choose a simple to understand exercise, but one that's impossible to complete in the time frame that we're giving. Because we want to shift the focus from, like I said, from, a, from rushing a partial solution or from rushing a complete solution to creating a well-factored partial solution. And during the pair, we want to encourage healthy dialogue. We're here to help and discuss and discuss ideas just like we would be if they were on the team, for real. Some things we're going to focus on are how do they get started, how do they allow a solution to emerge, how efficient are they with their tool set, and how do they use tests to help them program. We're also going to focus on a candidate's thought process during a pair session. And this allows us to learn things like how do they break up work, how do they envision progress, and how do they look for answers when they're stuck. And finally, a pair session is a fantastic way to learn how a candidate is going to learn and teach. We want them to come away from the experience feeling like it was valuable <laughs> if we do, do decide that it's not yet a good fit. We also want to see how open a candidate is to new ideas and self-improvement, so we're going to make sure to teach them something. 
when they spend time with us. And finally, we're going to see how they teach us. We need to be kind here and remember that it is still an interview. There's some nerves and some weird power dynamics at play, and it's okay to prompt people to teach you something. Some things that I like to fall back on are, why did you organize your code that way? Uh, that seems like a cool job. Could you tell me more about it? What is that awesome BIM plugin that looks like it could really speed up my workflow? So that covers the basic structure of nice technical interviews. Let's review the most important goals one last time and close it out. So we want to make the interview valuable for the candidate and us. We want to truly understand the candidate's skills. And we want a candidate to get the best feeling of what it's like to actually work for us as a company. We want to make the interview transparent and honest. We're going to say what we're thinking throughout the process instead of hiding our agenda. We're going to encourage the candidate. And we're going to ask the candidate their viewpoint instead of just assuming. We want to make the interview collective as well. We don't work in isolation. We don't work behind glass. We're not going to interview that way either. Instead, we'll encourage dialogue and conversation. Because this is an important chance to see how a candidate is going to work with us, how they'll learn from the team, and how they'll teach everyone around them. So thanks. Again, I'm Sam Jones. And if this type of interview sounds awesome, then reach out because Test Double is always in the Most importantly, though, implement some of these techniques on your team and spread the word because I want to hear more tweets about how tech interviews are getting nicer.